Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Mohammed Ahmed. So I've just created a short video with the help from Dr. Kelly Brooks and David Green of the GMO labs you would have taken uh, if you were still in the labs. So this uh, short video is just to supplement uh, what we went over in the GMO seminars. So please use them together when uh, studying for your examinations and for your online test. So the question we asked ourselves was, is your food genetically modified? And how would we go about answering this question? In the first week, we would have grinded non-GMO samples first to prevent or uh, avoid cross-contamination. This is what I covered in the GMO seminar. And then you would add a specialized uh, master mix known as Instagene to protect the DNA. And you would have heated it, add 100 degrees for five minutes, and then centrifug centrifugation of those samples to, to collect the pellet at the bottom of cell debris. So why do we have these steps? So the grinding of food that we had or will have, would have had uh, is release of DNA, instagene to protect the degradation of DNA from the DNA adding of small micro amounts of uh, DNA such as for 50 microliters to prevent oversaturation of the PCR reaction. Too much DNA can inhibit the PCR reaction. Boiling, boiling uh, releases DNA from food in, into the instagene solution. And also the pellet of the master mix prevents any cell debris interacting with the PCR reaction. This is a part of PCR reaction mix. I'm sure you're aware of this now after following and um, listening to my GMO seminars. So the main concept is to provide the DNA, provide the primers and the associated uh, components to provide uh, a lead to amplification of your DNA target. We have two controls. We have a non-GMO control for a negative control, and we have two uh, another one known as GMO positive control. These are to confirm that our uh, PCR was sufficient and valid for analysis. Once we prepared our master mixes, we had a red master mix uh, which would contain our GMO primers and a green master mix which would contain our plant primers and all samples, all DNA that we extracted would lead to this PCR setup. And this PCR setup I'm referring to is this table here. For example, tube 1 would have contained 20 microliters of plant master mix plus 20 microliters of non-GMO food. And then you would have followed this table step by step manner. Don't forget PCR consists of three steps and this would have occurred at the end of lab one where you would have heated the DNA strands to, to, to break the DNA bonds to give access to the primers. This is the second step known as annealing. The primers bind to specific locations of the DNA template and the final one is when you've got the uh, activation of tag polymerase during the extension stage leading to replication of DNA. And this would have occurred 40 times in the cycle while you were at home. Uh, by the time you would have got home. So at the end of day one, you would have corrected, extracted your DNA, you wouldn't have set up your PCR reactions, and then uh, waited a week for the further analysis of your uh, PCR products. So before we go into that, I just want to show you a short video provided by David Green, who kindly provided a short video on how what, what would have actually happened during your first week of GMO lab. So I'll see you the side of his video. Taking two epindors filled with 500 microliters of instrogen each, label one non-GMO and one test. Weigh out two grams of non-GMO food and place into the mortar. Add 10 milliliters of distilled water. Take care to make sure everything remains sterile during this process. Grind.
Grind in the pestle and mortar for at least two minutes to form a slurry. Add 10 milliliters of water again and grind with a pestle and mortar until smooth enough to pipette. Pet 50 microliters of the ground slurry and place into the non-GMO tube using the 50 microliter mark on the top of a graduated pipette. 50 microliters is just the end of the pipette as shown in the video. Recap the epidolf and invert several times to mix. Repeat this whole process for the GMO food and proceed to the next steps. Place the epidolf lid lock on the, each epidolf and make sure it's secure. Set the hot block to 95 degrees C and when it reaches temperature place both epidolfs into the hot block for five minutes. Place the tubes in a centrifuge in a balanced conformation and centrifuge at 13,000 RPM for five minutes. To set up the PCR reactions, number PCR tubes 1 to 6. The numbers should correspond to the following tube contents. Both plant and GMO primers are being tested alongside non-GMO food, test food and GMO positive controlled DNA. Referring to the table and using a fresh tip for each addition, add 20 microliters of the indicated master mix to each PCR tube. Then add 20 microliters of indicated DNA to each PCR tubes, being sure to avoid the instagene pellet at the bottom of the tubes. A critical step is to avoid transferring the instagene matrix. Mix by pipetting gently up and down and recap tubes. If necessary, centrifuge the tubes to collect contents at the bottom of the PCR tube and place PCR tubes into the thermal cycler. Once the PCR is complete, pull spin each tube for three seconds. Pipette 10 microliters of loading dye into each tube and load the gel. The Ego gel is 3% and load 20 microliters of molecular weight ruler and 20 microliters of each sample into your gel in the following order.
So now we have to cover the second week of the GMO lab. So hopefully David's uh, video was very helpful in understanding what you would have done in the first week. Now we move on to the second week. And this part is based on this part is based on completing the steps where we do electrophoresis or so agrogel electrophoresis for PCR products from week one and we analyze and interpret the results that we get from this. So again, most of this I was covered in the GMO seminar, so I'll go back to that lecture capture and that will be, uh, help and explain the process of gel electrophoresis. But very quickly, we run the samples on agro-gel electrophoresis, which allows the separation based on size. And be careful that it's not based on uh, the length or the thickness of the band itself. It's based on the molecular size of the product that you're separating. Loading buffer is an additional mode, but in this case you had already have red and green dyes already added to the master mix, which means that this step is eliminated, but it's also important uh, in a research context, context why you add and need loading dyes for your loading uh, for the loading of your samples to gel. And this again was covered in the GMO seminars. One point I do want to make is that in the top right corner of the gel, which the technicians normally add CyberSafe to, so what is CyberSafe? CyberSafe is a component which allows or binds to double stranded DNA, such as PCR products, and then fluorescence under UV uh, light. And this allows the detection and visualization of bands, uh, especially for double stranded DNA. So the loading of samples would have occurred in this manner, lens 1 to 7, and all these samples would have been lined up and analyzed post this. Electrophoresis would have occurred at 30, 100 volts for 30 minutes, and then you would have come back and did your analysis with the gels. So this is what the run of a gel would look like. You bring your gel and you document what you saw, and you would be able to hopefully see banding on the different wells. So what do the individual banding mean? So this is a good illustration which you would have seen a couple of times in my GMO labs and GMO seminars is that how do I identify whether I've got a positive GMO uh, GMO reaction or a negative GMO reaction. So the first thing we look at is lens 6 uh, and 5 just to confirm our positives and negative uh, positive controls that worked. So we've got number 6 which is our GMO positive template which is positive which is this particular size well uh, we have a positive uh, plant uh, template here which is a different molecular size so either size would represent whether it's a positive plant plant is GMO or no amplification would suggest negative for GM, genetically modified sample so simply looking at the gels itself you can see from lens 4 the top gel that lens 4 has a positive band of GMO detected DNA we know this because this has the same size band as of a positive uh, GMO sample so we know the corresponding 6 and 4 match the molecular size, meaning that the GMO, yeah, the sample that we tested, which is unknown, is genetically modified. While the bottom gel, LEM4, has an absent gel, uh, absent band, which means that uh, compared to our control in sample 6, it's not genetically modified and it's negative. So it's potentially uh, organic or a non-genetically modified sample. And this is what you would have tried to take away with you. Uh, Dr. Keely Books has currently provided this uh, examples of past gels to give you an idea of what you may or may not have ex uh, expected. Uh, so how would you interpret these samples? So the first thing as Keely, uh, Dr. Brooks has done is she's looked at sample 5 and sample 6 to make sure we've got the controls, positive controls are working, but then uh, illustrated that we've got different size bands which don't correspond to the positives. So how, what do you think these bands represent, for example? And okay, Dr. Brooks has also provided a gel which has no amplification at all. So what PCR, uh, what basically has happened to this PCR and what do you think the reasons are for this? What potential problems could have been, uh, could have happened for these students to have had this gel come back negative? There is another gel David Green has provided in the next video at the end, which is uh, one of the kind of uh, best, better examples of a good run. And hopefully all three gels will give you an idea of how to inter interpret it, the data. And don't forget to use the previous slides, uh, diagrams, to do drawings to help with this analysis. 
So I'm going to hand it over back over to David Green to do the demonstration for week two, where he's going to demonstrate electrophoresis and the analysis interpretation at the end of the video. And don't forget to look at my GMO lectures and seminars uh, to kind of supplement this uh, interpretations. Well, at 100 volts for 30 minutes. At the end of electrophoresis, take the gel out of the apparatus and visualise on the gel documentation system. The gel image shown shows that the non-GMO food sample was present through the observation of a band in lane 2, which is aliquoted with the plant master mix. Additionally, there was no band in lane 3, which contained the non-GMO sample and GMO master mix, acting as a negative control. Lane 6 and 7 contain GMO positive DNA with plant master mix and GMO master mix respectively. Bands are present in both lanes demonstrating that it was plant DNA and was GMO positive acting as a positive control. Lanes 4 and 5 contain the test sample with plant master mix and GMO master mix respectively. As is evident from this image, there is a clear band in lane 4 evidencing that it is plant sample. There is also a band in lane 5 which contained a GMO master mix, providing that the test sample was GMO positive. Now I'm going to just demonstrate or give you three past exam questions on the MCQs, just to give you an idea or feel of what kind of questions we can ask you on the online test in relation to, in relation to the GMO labs and the uh, templates that we've provided. So these are the three questions I've provided to you. So the first one is how can I test a food to find out if it is if it contains material derived from a genetically modified organism? So what would the answer be for that? An amplification of cycle of PCA consists of the following steps in order. And the last one is true or false. The purpose of GMO positive control DNA is for checking that the plant PCA primers are working. So I won't provide the answers yet, but this is what you should be able to identify and the answers are widely available in the GMO seminars and the, the short video plus any, any additional information I provided during these sessions. Uh, just be aware that uh, the online test will be going on in May. So just make sure you know the availability of the time, the date, and also the setup will be provided by Dr. Ali. And if you need any C or you need extra time, please Dr. To speak to Dr. Ali and he will aim to provide you access for that. And if you need any additional information, please keep your eyes on uh, the, your emails, but also your now module page. And if you're really not sure, still email Dr. Ali for further information. So I'd like to thank you for listening. And remember to supplement this short video with uh, the GMO uh, lecture capture because both of them go in hand in hand and they require, uh, and the GMO seminar has additional information which you require for your online test. So good luck. See you soon.